Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation, Shift Left Ocular, the Google Maps for Auditing Your Code, brought to you by Shift Left. I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Chaitan Kaniki. Chaitan is a serial entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in authoring and architecting mission-critical software. His expertise includes building web-scale distributed infrastructure, personalization algorithms, complex event processing, fraud detection and prevention in investment and retail banking domains. He was most recently Chief, Chief Data Officer and GM Operations at Cloud Physics. Prior to Cloud Physics, he was part of early founding teams at Cash Edge, Business Signatures, and Enforce. Excellent. Thank you, Billy. Thanks for the introduction and a good day to all the attendees listening. Thank you for taking the time. The topic of today's webinar is Shift Left Ocular, the Google Maps for auditing your code. And as Billy stated, my name is Chetan Konicky. I'm the founder and CTO at Shift Left. Long gone are the days where interpret travelers got lost in back streets, fumbling through their map books as they paused to ask locals for directions. Unquestionably, the digital map has revolutionized the ease with which we can travel, whether it be by car, boat, plane, or foot. Punch in your destination in Google Maps search bar and you'll see directions, proposed alternative routes, real-time traffic conditions, and transit in real time. Switching context, digital maps displayed on our browsers or our mobile phones are powered by applications that are built, packaged, and deployed in a data center. These applications begin the journey as source code, where we as engineers initialize a project, name it, write a set of variables pertaining to that business domain, and then write functions encompassing that variables. Thereafter, other functions that communicate with that specific function and eventually package the entire project and deploy it in a microservice cluster. Therefore, when engineers reason about code, they think in terms of connected graphs. That is how a set of connected functions communicate with each other to serve a certain business need. When this code is compiled and deployed to production as microservices in a dense communication mess, AppSec and Ops teams begin to derive their insights with a topological view like what you see on the screen. Again, if you pay careful attention, this communication topology looks like one large connected graph. From an attacker's perspective, vulnerability discovery process can be likened to solving puzzles like mazes, jigsaws, and logic grids. One way to think about it abstractly is to see the process as a special kind of maze where you don't immediately have a bird's eye view of what it looks like. A map of the application is gradually forming over time through the exploration of the attacker. And the final map will almost never be 100% clear, but sufficient to figure out how to get from point A to point B. So let us pause and reflect as to why graphs seem to be the common construct of reasoning amongst all these three personas that we spoke of. And thereafter, let us attempt to answer the following questions. That is, why are graphs interesting? How can we represent source code as graphs? And thereafter, what can we learn from it? Graph theory boils down to places to go and ways to get there. A graph often refers to a collection of nodes communicating over edges, where nodes are places to be, edges are where to go. In the Congisberg example, the land masses and islands are nodes, and the bridges are edges. Coincidentally, compilers also use graphs 
to reason about code. And using this knowledge, it optimizes the code we as engineers write for performance tuned to the chipset upon which we deploy our code. Often programs are written in text. So the first step of the compiler is to identify if that text that we write in a certain sequence adheres to the language grammar. If it adheres to the language grammar, the next step is to determine and optimize control flow in the code. Each node in the graph represents a statement, statement like if x is equal to true, if x is equal to 10, where you're conducting some degree of criteria checks, and the edges represent control flow between statements, meaning you're essentially executing a block of code if that certain condition is met. Data flow analysis provides additional insights about the lineage of data. When we write code, we initialize data, we create data, or we extract data from various sources like databases, etc. So when a data is initialized, it is initialized within either a function scope or within a packet scope. Thereafter, that data element is cloned, transformed, and passed across functions until your business need is met. So how can these three constructs benefit the purpose of discovering vulnerabilities in applications? Inspired with this very sound foundation of compiler technology, our chief scientist, Dr. Fabian Yamaguchi, invented the code property graph. The code property graph is essentially a versatile graph of graphs, depicting connectivity of an application and all of its piece parts. Because if you examine today's modern application of microservice, it is comprised of the logic code that you write as an engineer and a set of open source libraries that you're using to serve your needs and the open source framework upon which it is deployed. The code property graph creates a multi-layered, three-dimensional representation of the code's call graph, data flow, and the control flow with unprecedented insights that enable developers and analysts to fundamentally understand an application security posture. Code property graph details include representation of programming language constructs, custom codes, and open source elements, all as a single cohesive unit, irrespective of which programming language you write your code in. Thereafter, high-level information flows are the second core ingredient of the code property graph. Inspired by Linux and Unix file descriptors, the idea is to mark parameters of sources, sinks, and transformations. Sources are where your consumers interact with your application via API endpoints or web routes. Sinks are all outbound communication points in your application where your application either looks up a database, a file system, or communicates with another microservice to either retrieve or pass data. However, the graph format needs to be coupled with an effective query engine that lets someone ask security-related questions interactively and take answers back to improve the security posture of the application. So if we think less abstractly, the process boils down to three steps. Enumerate all en entry points, the ways of interacting with the application, which typically are API endpoints or web routes. The next step is to reason about insecure states or vulnerabilities that an attacker or an adversarial entity would interact with these entry points and would like to manifest. Thereafter, explore ways to manipulate or exploit the app using these identified entry points to reach the, those insecure states that we spoke of. Again, this reasoning is likened to navigate a graph from entry point to exit point. So Ocular is this tool that provides the ability to query the graph and ask these fundamental questions that we just spoke of. So buckle up, let's navigate 
a simple microservice using Ocular so that we understand how we can derive value and extract the security posture of the application. What I'm going to do shortly is use an example web service application called as Tarpit that essentially represents a typical microservice fraught with several seeded vulnerabilities. The first step is to compile this application. Given that this is a typical Java application and it is open source, anyone listening on this webinar will be able to access this application available on the route github.com Carnegie C Tarpit. The first step is I'm going to compile this application or create a package. Given that this is a Java based application, the consequence of building the package produces a war file, which essentially is a web application archive. The next step is I'm going to create a graph by providing this Java war file as an input. So the command to do that is using a daemon called as Java to CPG, which is a shell script that takes an, as input the war file and generates the code property graph that we just spoke of. This versatile graph format can typically be created in a matter of seconds or minutes, depending on the complexity of the application. We have benchmarked that the graph generation can complete with a mil over half a million lines of code in less than 10 minutes. So given that the graph is generated, let us go ahead and load up or fire up the Ocular Shell. The Ocular Shell is an interactive console. This can be likened to a typical PL SQL shell that you use to interact with an Oracle database or a MongoDB database, et cetera. So this shell lets you load that graph that we just created and thereafter begin to ask questions over your code in order to derive security insights. I'm going to shortly load a couple of uh, housekeeping scripts that I usually have. The next step is I'm going to load the graph that we just created using the command load CPG. And the input to this command is the graph that I just created shortly a few seconds ago. As the graph is loaded in the shell, we have the capability available to ask questions over this piece of code that we just spoke of in scope of Oculus session. Now, given the graph is loaded, let's start by asking some interesting questions like, this is a web application. Of course, it has RESTful and API endpoints. So give me all the endpoints available on the application. And prior to that, first let's identify all the types because you know, as programmers, we declare different packages and perhaps use different open source libraries. So the first question is, give me all types that exist in this program. So here you get a list of all packages that you are using in this piece of code. Sometimes you might have a certain blacklist defined in your company not to use a certain package. So using this API, you can identify whether an engineer has violated that constraint or not. Let us ask another simple question, which is, you know, of course, as engineers, uh, we hard code certain string messages. And in certain cases, we commit mistakes by hard coding uh, PII credentials in our code. So let us look at all such hard coded credentials that exist in the code, or perhaps just messages and strings that we want to communicate with our consumers. So here are a list of all hard coded elements in the code. You know, this becomes critically important in two cases. One is to identify if an engineer is mistakenly hard coding certain keys in the code, which happens more often than you think. And in other cases, if your code is internationalized, you want to make sure that you're UTF compliant. So here you can get a complete laundry list of all hard-coded elements in the code using this API. 
Let us go one step further and ask a question whether they are any hard-coded AWS keys in this code. Using this Fluent API, I essentially ask for all methods containing literals of type AWS access keys. And lo and behold, we have one AWS key that we have identified out here. Let us go one step further and ask which method in your code is actually hard coding these credentials. Because from a code review perspective, we want to make sure this does not happen again. So I'm taking that same construct where I say CPG method literal code and get the full name of the method where this particular AWS keys are hard coded. Of course, I received the package IO shift left serverlet target do get. Let's quickly examine this code to see where exactly this is hard coded. So here I'm navigating to tarpit, IO shift left serverlet tarpit, heading to the method do get, and lo and behold, we have the AWS key and secret key hard coded in the code. This is a bad practice because if these credentials for some reason are checked in a public repo, then we are compromising our entire cloud's data. Now let us move one step further and ask a question of all the dependencies or open source dependencies that this particular application is using. Using a Fluent API, which is cpg.dependency.list, we get a version dependent pair tuple displayed. Now, it might be interesting if we go one step further and ask if you're using any vulnerable open source library in our application. So again, using a Fluent API SCA, which stands for Software Composition Analysis, get CVEs, we can call upon the CVE and NIST database to identify if we are herding or utilizing any vulnerable open source library. For this, you typically have to use a separate product uh, like Black Duck to identify the existence of vulnerable open source libraries. In our case, what you effectively have to do is just call one single API and you get a JSON export of all vulnerable libraries having CVEs associated with it. So this is a very quick JSON export and it's clearly evident that we are using a vulnerable library which is Jackson Data Binder version 2.8.7, carrying several CVEs mapped to it in the NIST database. We have merely scratched the surface here. The sky is not the limit with Oculus Interactive API. Now let's zoom into certain specific use cases to uncover information flows with symptoms leading to unknown vulnerabilities, business logic flaws, and information leakage. So our first use case that we're going to speak of is a denial of service attack. Now, denial of service attack is a common type of attack that happens if you have the necessary symptoms in your code that led, lends for it to manifest. This code snippet that you see represents the act of performing a DOS attack or what they call as a denial of service attack, which provides the system from hampering the service for your legitimate users if an attack attacker attempts to successfully attack your application. The vulnerability of this type is hard to detect. The difficulty results from the fact that person who's reviewing the source code has to mentally track all the variables that are initialized in the code. For instance, if you pay attention to the highlighted portions of this code, we have a function do get which essentially accepts an HTTP serverlet request and performs a function. The first call of order of this particular function is to get a database connection. As all diligent citizens and good programmers, we create a go, we essentially create a global connection from by executing this function, get connection, and thereafter look up our values in the database and serve responses back. So with this consequence, if you notice, you might have one user repeatedly executing this do get request, leading to connection exhaust, which further leads for your application to crash. 
Therefore, it is important that each one of these resources that we initialize has to be released because that's a good practice. Because a malicious user could send thousands or millions of requests on this page and rendering the server not to respond to even your consumers. So the very symptoms out here uh, in terms of bad pro programming practices that lead for this attack to manifest. Firstly, is we're using a global connection, initializing it and not releasing the resource. Secondly, is we are not using connection pools because if we, wait, wait, if we were to allocate a connection pool, then we effectively use that resource. And at the deinitialization de point, we release that resource. So let us ask these questions using Ocular to identify, first of all, if we are getting a global connection from any driver that we're using, um, connected to either a MySQL database or any database that you're using. So in this case, it's evident that we are getting a connection and uh, Ocular provides a set of batteries included uh, drivers, endpoints, so that you do not have to codify if you happen to use Hibernate, iBatis, or one of these Java-based database interaction libraries. We have done all the hard work for you. So the next question that you would ask is, given that we are initializing a connection, is this connection being closed? So there is a global variable called as DB initializers. In this case, there is, um, we are checking to see if a connection close is accommodated in this function that we are speaking of. So by calling CPG method full name DB initializers connection close and getting the size, it's evident that the engineer is not closing the connection. The third question that we're gonna ask is, is a connection pool being used? because there's several types of connection pools like uh, Hakari DB, Apache Commons DBCP, C3PO that are recommended as good practices to use so that as new requests are initiated, a connection is provided from the connection resource pool and released at the exit of the function. So obviously we got two false, which means a connection is created, but that is not closed and neither is a connection pool used. So if you take all these three conditions in unison and evaluate it, then you get a consequential situation that this particular code snippet is susceptible to a denial of service attack. So let us move to a next use case, which is a very common use case called as uh, SQL injection, which majority of you uh, viewers are familiar with. This code has at least three mistakes. This particular code do get receives an HTTP request as an input, and we get a login variable from the request parameter. And thereafter, this login variable is concatenated to a string in order to form your SQL request. Now the string is prepared using prepare statement, which is a pretty good optimization and thereafter the values are retrieved from the database. Symptomatically, the engineer might argue that he's using a prepared statement, so he's guarding from typical symptoms of SQL injection. But note where the vulnerability lies is that the login and password is retrieved from an untrusted input and directly concatenated to a string without sanitization. This leads for an attacker to submit malicious content, leading for unintended results to be returned uh, if he has the capability of retrieving that in the response. Now let us go ahead and use Ocular to ask these following questions of whether this piece of code is susceptible to SQL injection. Again, we drop console into the Ocular shell, and I'm gonna ask a set of questions. The first question is whether we are using any method of call named do get, of course we are, because this is a web servlet request that's accepting a web servlet request. The next is, is any input that is retrieved or from the HTTP servlet request passed to the prepared statement? In, as a form of a string. And thereafter, 
between it being retrieved from the HTTP servlet request to the point where it's prepared, are we conducting any validation? So Ocular returns an entire flow trace, a very succinct flow trace, so that you understand everything that is happening from the entry point to the point where the exploit can be triggered. So on paying careful attention here, of course, we are retrieving login, we are retrieving password, we are appending that to a SQL string, and thereafter directly calling prepared statement. And note, there is no sanitization happening anywhere from the entry point to the exit point, which goes to show that this piece of code is susceptible to SQL injection. Now, of course, as security researchers and code auditors, we'd like to take this information back to our engineers so that they can conduct triage and resolve this incident. So without losing fidelity, we take that flow that we just noticed and get a pretty printed JSON representation of it so that we can create an GitHub issue so that the engineer can triage and look at it. So using a simple API, I was able to effectively take that issue, take that flow trace and send it back to the engineer so that it's posted in the issues for him to address and triage. So literally in one step, I created a GitHub issue with the associated project. So Ocular lets you add any integration to various subsystems like Jira, GitHub, Bugzilla, et cetera, from the scope of the session. So that any findings that you identify that is violating your security posture can be taken back to your engineering staff. So let us switch gears and look at the next use case, which is information leakage. A data breach is an intentional or inadvertent exposure of confidential information to unauthorized parties. In the digital era, data has become one of the most critical components of an enterprise. Data leakage poses serious threats to organizations including significant reputation damage and financial loss. As volumes of data are created and grows exponentially, data breaches are happening more frequently than ever before. So detecting and preventing data loss has become one of the most pressing security concerns of enterprises. There are multiple points and opportunities for an enterprise to deploy effective protections to secure sensitive data against inadvertent and malicious leak threats that might appear during data storage, usage, and perhaps data movement. So upon the code property graph, we have invented a technique using natural language processing and machine learning to identify variable names and sensitive data. And thereafter, we categorize and classify them. So I'm going to quickly show you that by virtue of a simple command of how we can detect all sensitive data elements in your code. So let us switch back to Ocular. And upon this code, I'm going to ask a very simple question. Sensitive get sensitive classes. And lo and behold, I get back all user defined types and system defined types that are classified as sensitive using a natural language processing and a machine learning technique. I would like to draw your attention to two user-defined types here, which is model.order and model.user. Note that these two user-defined types are categorized and classified as ones holding credentials, PII, location information. That's fairly interesting. Let us take a quick glance at why it has been categorized as sensitive. So I'm going to quickly shift to the model definition in the code. If you pay attention, we have this class user defined, which is typically a data structure that any engineer would define if you're dealing with consumers um, you know, in your business line. And of course, the consumer has attributes like username, first name, last name, passport number, address, etc. So using our natural language processing and machine learning, we examine the name of the user-defined type 
and its associated attributes, and then score and rank this element as sensitive. And after it's marked as sensitive, we match it against various compliance and regulatory data points, and then classify them as critical sensitive data. Now, just classifying them is insufficient. So, you know, it's great, but, you know, let's pick one of one such sensitive data variable and track if it's being leaked in clear text to a log file, because this use case happens more than you think, because we as engineers are coding in hurry, and we'd like to have visibility into everything that's happening in our code. So firstly, I'm going to ask this very simple question, which is, Give me all reference points using a variable of user defined type user, which is the model that we just examined. And then I'm declaring a sync of type loggers because you know all of us use logs. And if we log any information, either as in debug state or info state, that gets carried on via our syslog to a logging vendor like Splunk or Sumo Logic or Logly, and that provides unprecedented visibility for us to conduct triages. So this question is, is any user data being logged unconditionally without redaction and obfuscation to the log file in clear text? And if so, of course, we are violating compliances like GDPR, SOC 1, Type 1, Type 2, etc. Again, the results are served back in a very succinct and detailed flow trace. This flow trace gives you information from point of emergence where we are declaring that user defined type in our function. And at which point we are actually logging out that data to the log file in clear text without applying redaction or obfuscation. Clearly, that if this is discovered early, there is enough evidence for our engineers to go ahead and fix this issue and not be in compliance violation uh, because of. Off late, we have newer compliances defined every month owing to the number of data breaches that are exponentially happening week per week. This is one use case of a user defined type. This is fairly interesting. Uh, not too long ago, just a few minutes ago, we examined the AWS keys hard coded in the code. So let us switch gears and look at a contrarian point of view, meaning not look at the user defined type, but look at it value. In this case, it is an AWS key type. So CPG or Ocular with CPG provides the ability for you to inspect values in code as well. So you'll be asking a question if there are there any AWS or Azure or GCP like keys hard coded in your code? And if so, are there any situations where this particular code is being logged to the log file in clear text. So again, we're going to perform a very simple check, which is a reachability analysis. And lo and behold, we have the AWS key, like you saw earlier, hard-coded in the code, which is essentially being appended to a string and then logged in clear text. So now your Splunk admin or your logging admin has visibility into all of the keys of your cloud vendors in clear text. Now, this is a bad coding pattern and a gross violation of compliance. So let us switch case from information leakage uh, into another use case where often as logs, we propagate that log data into an exception trace. And in certain cases, if you don't obfuscate and hide the exception data detail, all of that detail can manifest into your browser. Attackers often use this to conduct what they call as reconnaissance, where they attempt a series of spray and pray exploits on your web application to see if it yields an exception. And note that a simple exception like this is giving him or her sufficient information to understand the construct of your application. In this case, it's telling the attacker the application language, the database login, the server's IP, the full stack trace, the server's name and version, and a lot more. So such patterns have to be carefully examined 
And Ocular lets you identify these patterns, automate for it so that you measure your code release per release so that you ensure such information is not exposed, which essentially leads for an attacker to take advantage of. So let us quickly switch case to a typical business logic flaw and an architectural flaw called as cookie poisoning. As we all know, the main purpose of cookie is to identify users and possibly customize their experience based on their profile. However, in this code snippet, there are three problems. The first problem is the fact that sensitive information is being added as plain text to the cookie, which is your login. The other is that the developer did not set a particular attribute called as HTTP only, because if a browser supports it, as most modern browsers do, it will not allow the user to change the value of the cookie, which typically a malicious attacker would do. The third and the possible problem is in the fact that the developer did not send a secure attribute. Developers usually store all, store all sorts of information in cookies because cookies are easy to be manipulated. They can exchange information from the server to the browser and vice versa. The difficulty of finding a vulnerability in the process lies on the fact of how the cookie is used among several program statements that you have intertwined in this piece of code. So let us quickly ask a question in Ocular to identify whether this piece of code uh, carries the symptom of this architectural or business logic flaw, which is called as cookie poisoning. And the steps that we're going to check for is we are receiving an HTTP request, which is assigned to login. And that login is being set in clear text to this cookie element, which is initialized. And thereafter, we are forwarding um, the request to dashboard JSP, which is rendered on the browser. And that's a, that appropriate information is saved as a cookie on the appropriate user's you know, uh, machine. So using uh, Ocular, I'm going to ask these series of questions. The first question that I'm going to ask is, is the cookie initialized? And is there an add cookie being set without a set, set HTTP only or a set secure attribute. So note that the question that I asked had the following elements to it. First of all, a, is a cookie initialized? Is an add cookie called? And in that flow between the point of where it is initialized and add cookie, are we setting HTTP only or set secure? So if you receive a stack trace because I use passes not, it's of course evident that the engineer has not set the HTTP or set secure flag. The next question that I'm going to ask is after that add cookie, are we forwarding the request uh, in context to another page or another controller? And if this again carries the consequence of uh, not having the set secure flag set. Again, it's evident that we have the add cookie and a forward dispatcher carrying that add, that particular cookie without set HTTP only and set secure. So it is clear in this case that all symptoms associated with cookie poisoning exists. Again, like I illustrated before, you can take this information and the stack trace and file a GitHub issue automatically within the scope of session of your interaction in Ocular, or you can execute Ocular in your pipeline to automatically evaluate for such conditions with preset policies. Now let's switch context and examine another use case, which is weak crypto. Broken or deprecated ciphers have typically known weaknesses. An attacker might be able to brute force the secret key used for encryption if you're essentially encrypting certain critical and sensitive data in your application. DES, triple DES, MD4, MD5 are not considered strong ciphers for modern applications. Currently, NIST 
and CVE recommends the usage of AES block ciphers instead. There are several companies that effectively have used old ciphers and outdated MD5 hashing algorithms to scramble passwords. And most of, and as a consequence of a data breach, if that data lands up in the hands of an attacker, it would take less or no time for an attacker to unscramble their password if a weak crypto is used. So by examining this piece of code, it is evident that the engineer is using a weak crypto, which is DES, and thereafter initializing a critical sensitive element called as credit info, which essentially contains credit card info with that weak crypto. And in this case, the user is logging that data back to the log file. Now, this is a bad coding pattern, which essentially is in part a weak architectural flaw and a business logic flaw. Weak architectural, because the engineer is effectively using a weak crypto that can be unscrambled. A business logic flaw, because if the data is breached, then an attacker can take less or no time to unscramble these sensitive elements. So let us use Ocular to ask whether this piece of code is susceptible to that weakness. Again, using Ocular's flow semantic, I'm going to ask the first question of give me all sources using a weak crypto like DES, MD5, RC4, Blowfish, SHA1, et cetera. And thereafter, identify if it is initialized and a do final is called, which essentially is a point of um, initializing it prior to using it upon a sensitive element. Lo and behold, I receive a flow trace, uh, which evidently says that this piece of code is using DES and a do final is called in this specific line of code uh, that we indicate in servlet topic, the piece of code that we're speaking of. Now, the next step is if it is initialized using a weak crypto, what else is happening in the code? And evidently what we saw in this piece of code was that this sensitive element was um, scrambled and thereafter logged, which is even worse. So here I'm asking the simple question again, where after do final, is this information being logged? And if so, can Ocular tell me that? Of course, again, we receive this very fluent stack trace that gives us information that a do final is clause and a string is composed and logged out and there was no effective transformation happening in between. So using this data, you can effectively mandate across all applications in your organization to use an crypto of strong strength that is also designed to be slow so that a hacker will not be able to take over breached accounts in an event of a data breach or a data compromise. Lastly, Ocular provides a fluent API that enables one to extract the entire attack surface of the application, which contains all API endpoints and its associated vulnerabilities categorized by OWASP in a single fluent API. Using this API called as get attack surface, you can effectively fetch all API endpoints or routes in the web application with its associated OWASP vulnerability that it carries the symptoms of and the untrusted input that can influence or cause this vulnerability to manifest with a description that describes the risk and the mitigation so that you can effectively triage and resolve. Using this data, you could effectively configure your upstream endpoint protection devices like WAFs or take this information and hand it over to your rep team so that they can conduct targeted attacks in your UAT or staging environment to ensure that all such high critical vulnerabilities are addressed and fixed before your code is deployed to production. With that, I would recommend all attendees to try Ocular on your code. We provide a 14-day free trial of Ocular that can be downloaded from 
go.shiftlab.io slash ocular free trial. Currently, Ocular supports Java only, and the trial version does not include security profiles, which is an advanced batteries included set of policies that we provide. And if you wish to experience that, feel free to reach out to sales at shiftleft.io so we can provide an extended full feature trial. Thank you for all attendees listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions that have come in. The first question that we have is, how is Ocular different from SAST? Great question. Software, SAST stands for Software Application Security Testing. Uh, if you're fluent with uh, security code scanners, that's what SAST means. The core focus of code scanners is to identify inherent vulnerabilities in your code categorized by bodies like OVASP, NISTs, CVE, etc. Ocular expands the horizon beyond identifying vulnerabilities. Using Ocular's interactive console, you can identify known vulnerabilities, meaning symptoms that exist that would lend, that would lead for a vulnerability to manifest, and even unknown vulnerabilities that might exist because you might perhaps have a condition in your code leading for an attacker to exploit an open source library that might be used in an unsafe way. And you can go beyond vulnerabilities to identify business logic flaws, insider attacks or rootkits, and information leakage. Awesome. The next question that we have is, does Ocular use CVEs to identify vulnerabilities in open source libraries? No. Ocular does not use CVEs to identify vulnerabilities. Ocular has the capability of measuring all the symptoms that lie behind either a known or an unknown vulnerability. Because if you quickly take a look at any description associated with the CVE, they are a set of conditions that exist in unison leading for the exploit to manifest. So like we noticed with all of the use cases that I described, Ocular has the capability to query and ask questions. And each of these questions, either individually or together with other questions, would lead for a vulnerability to manifest. So Ocular has the capability of examining the symptoms behind CVEs. So it is beyond the scope of typically just matching against CVEs, which is a threat landscape. Great. The next question that we have is, how can queries be written for one language and be used for other languages? Great question. Like we spoke of, the CPG or the code property graph is a versatile graph of graphs. So you can take code written in any programming language and map it to this uniform representation called as the code property graph. Using the code property graph, you can use Ocular to query upon it to identify symptoms. Given that code property graph is a uniform representation, agnostic of the programming language that you use, you will be able to query across your entire programming stack. If your stack comprises of JavaScript at the front end, Java or Golang or Python at the back end, very soon as we support newer programming languages, uh, including Java and C, C++ that we support today, you will be able to use the same query constructs or languages that you just notice I use and query across all these language stacks very seamlessly. Great, we do have one more question. So audience, if you do have any more questions, please post them into the questions panel. The last question that we currently have is, after I write a query that I'm happy with, can I enforce it as a policy on future releases? Yes, after you write a query, you can define that query to be evaluated 
upon every release of your application. The shift left product suite has another product called as inspect that lets you import the queries that you create in ocular so that it automatically evaluates every application in your company and its associated releases. Great. Well, that does look like all the questions we have. So, Chatan, is there anything you would like to add before I close things out? Thank you very much. I do encourage you to uh, visit our website, download Ocular, try Ocular. We do have a community website, which is also called as community.ocular.io. Uh, feel free to use Ocular and share your questions with us. We are happy to help you navigate and understand how you could improve the security posture of your application going forwards.